Hi everyone, my name is Louise Kapener and I'm going to be leading today's Computational Social Science Introductory Workshop. So just a little disclaimer, um, this session is focused on introducing you to the concepts of CSS, so we're not going to be covering more advanced topics including, you know, the epistemological and theoretical challenges posed by CSS, um, nor are we going to be focusing on the ins and outs of one particular computational method. Although if you are interested in the workshops and resources that we have on different computational methods, um, Emma, uh, again, is going to post another link in our chat, which will link you to our UKDS YouTube CSS playlist, um, which has a bunch of all of our talks where you can uh, follow through and uh, see all the stuff we've done. We've got stuff on like machine learning, clustering and text mining, all that good stuff. And um, she's also going to drop a link to our GitHub, which has our repositories that contain interactive coding notebooks and other materials. So you can sort of like follow along with, like I've said, you know, a bunch of stuff on text mining, for example, machine learning, all of that. So what we'll be doing today is covering three main sections, which include what is up with computational social science? So what does this even mean? How do I become a computational social scientist? So what sort of like skills um, am I going to need? And then we'll look at the eight steps of computational social science, which is where we'll have the most interactive part of the workshop and where you can get stuck in sketching out a CSS project for yourself. And of course, at the end, there will be time for final thoughts and any questions that you might have. I'll just see what the chat's doing. OK, everything looks all good. All right. So what is computational social science? So it is the use of computational and empirical methods to address social science questions. So let's break that down just a little bit more. Um, computational social science requires human thinking to identify important research questions. And that sounds um, a bit derivative, right? Human thinking. But what we mean by that is that we're dealing with social science questions that, you know, um, that require this understanding of how people behave and what they want, um, you know, what they want to achieve. So we need that social science sort of way of thinking in order to formulate those really interesting research questions. But of course, we also need a little sprinkle of more computer thinking, and that's in order to turn these questions into computational or empirical methods. So, you know, you've got your social science research question, but how are we going to implement that? Like, how are we going to measure it in a way that a machine would understand? And after completing your research, you're going to need that social science brain, again, that sort of more human thinking to effectively communicate those results to other people. So another way to understand social science is to think about what its main components are or what it's not. So let's just go through a few points. So computational social science is not just using computers within a social science research project. So it's not just using digital versions of purely traditional social science methods. So, you know, it's not just using SPSS to analyze survey data. And it's not just using digital, but purely non-empirical methods. So I'll go ahead and untangle these a little bit if they're not um, entirely obvious. So here are some examples that might put this into uh, context a little bit. So one example of a CSS project would be collecting, processing and analysing millions of online news articles to show changing political attitudes. So you can see how we have that social science thinking here in order to formulate um, our research question about political attitudes, but also we have that computer thinking which is inherent in using a uh, computational methods. So in this case, uh, we'd be using web scraping uh, to gather a massive amount of news articles. So that's how we'd be acquiring our data. If we look at a second example, we could also use real-time weather and traffic data to, to look at how travelers react. So for example, you know, maybe you hear that there's a new storm that has caused damage to a local town, and you're interested at in looking how, uh, how um, people react um, to this event and how it's dealt with in real time. 
So you can see how this project isn't just a case of using a computer within a social science project or just using a digital version of traditional social science methods. Instead, we have these uniquely computational methods. We have some other examples, which include combining data from novel wearables or apps to look at establishing a correlation between social media activity and heart rate. So this could be aiming to answer a social science question, maybe about how people feel about certain images. So you could look at how they react, are there positive or negative feelings evoked, or are they irritated, and so on. And our final example, um, you know, we could be interested in mapping family names over time. And we could do this by importing, processing, and formatting centuries of parish records. This could allow you to explore the movement of certain families to different areas, and maybe you could explore the changes in family sizes or whether they moved away or not. So these are just a few kind of broad, but um, really you know, key uh, examples of CSS projects. So moving on, um, there are key factors that um, make a CSS projects computational, with the first being data volume, complexity, speed, difficulty, or novelty. This is more important than the exact data source or type. So in our previous example, uh, the one that we just left off with of um, parish records, the source of data is not entirely important. It's about you know, the sheer volume and the complexity and the speed or difficulty of that data. Additionally, the data must pertain to people, actions, behaviors, choices, or statements. And that brings us to the final point, which is that the research question course should be a social science research question. And it's one that's going to use atypical data to talk about how people make decisions or what influences their behavior and choices. So the exact research question is not important, but it must be a social science question. And this is kind of where we have that really obvious intersection between the computation and the social science. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So here we have a nice little quote. Um, so in essence, computational social science is an opportunity to do socially valuable research that would not be possible without computational methods and tools. So by this, um, I mean that we couldn't, for example, you know, manually scan years of police recorded statistics to try and understand how crime rates have changed over the last 10 years. This physically wouldn't be possible to do manually, but with the use of computers, we can apply advanced statistics and models to understand this kind of change in crime rates. So we can look at how we could count many types of crimes that have taken place in certain areas, and we could aggregate these crimes and then you know, map them spatially. We could explore the long-term trend seasonality or noise components of these different crime types. And this type of research just wouldn't be possible or it'd be massively, massive, massively difficult and um, time intensive without the use of computational methods. Another example could be web scraping millions of online articles to try and understand how political opinions have changed over the last 20 years. In order to get a sense of political opinions, we'd want to examine the words in articles and how many words belong to different categories and what sort of themes appear and maybe what the proportions are of these words and how that changes over time. And that's something that we won't be able to do without um, two you know, key computational methods, which is web scraping, which is where you know, we use um, uh, web scraping packages to sort of um, acquire or scrape data off certain websites and something called natural language processing where we can look at the proportion of words by using a coding package that's specifically designed with functions that help you do this. So to see whether any of that made sense, we're going to have a little bit of interaction and give you guys the chance to vote on whether you think a given project is a computational social science project or not. So if you head back over to Mentimeter, we can get this set up and then you can start voting. So you can see that the code's at the top of the screen again. You just head to menti.com. Uh, we can have a look at our first example. Okay, so 
our first um, case study, our first little project is um, where we want to scan historic recipes and use AI algorithms to recognize text with the aim of identifying ingredients and measures used over time. So what do we think? Is this computational social science or not? I'll just let a few more votes come through. Um, it looks like so far, oh, it's changing before my eyes. Um, so it seems like the majority of us so far think that this is not CSS. So it's not got that implicit social science question. Um, you know, I'd, um, I'd probably have to agree with that. Um, you know, we don't really have that sort of question there. We're not really asking any questions about people's behaviours and choices. Um, you know, you could see how there might be one lurking in there. You know, are we talking about how imported foreign foods integrate into domestic scenes and how people take that up and how it relates to maybe, you know, foreign foods becoming more normalised and accepted? So you can see that there, you know, maybe could be a social science question, but you know, we could also just be talking about the proportions of natural foods that um, people, are eat, uh, people are eating over time. And maybe then that's more of a just a biology question. So, yeah, I think I would have to go with the majority here in that it doesn't seem like this is a clear cut social science question. But um, I would probably have to disagree with it. I see that a few of you said there's not enough computation. Um, I'd say that we definitely uh, do seem to have these computational methods being used here. Um, you know, we've got um, scanning of historic recipes and using AI algorithms. Um, it definitely seems computational enough um, to me. But yeah, there's um, also some of you that have said, you know, I need more information to decide, which is completely valid. Um, so yeah, um, this is one of those annoying exercises where there's not always a right or wrong answer. I am just gonna, you know, talk about the different ways that we can see things. Um, I don't know whether that frustrates people or not, but these aren't always clear cut. So let's move on to the next one. Um, so I have someone right out the gate. Um, so. With this one, we are using gamified smart home displays to understand how people interact with energy saving technologies. So what do we reckon? Um, I'll just wait for a few more votes to come through. OK, so we have a lot of you arguing that this is definitely CSS. Um, we do have a fair chunk though saying that this is um, not CSS, there's, that there's not enough uh, computation there, which is um, quite interesting. So personally, I say this one is probably CSS. I'd have to go with the majority here. Um, but again, as with the other question, I think obviously it does depend. Um, it is hard to capture the nuances of a research project in just one sentence. So it's hard to know what the purpose is and what you expect the conclusions to show. But I think that um, a gamified smart home display probably would capture a lot of digital data, right, about how people react in terms of, you know, sort of looking at what time of day it is or who it is that's interacting with it. It could, you know, also possibly act as some sort of tracking data, you know. Um, so if the purpose is to try and change people's behaviour to make them engage more with energy saving technologies, um, then that would definitely pose some sort of re uh, social science research question. Um, you know, then you could import that data and have a look at it and, um, you know, apply some other sort of computational methods or techniques to it. So, you know, this is where we circle back to how we conceptualize our thoughts and processes. Um, but it's interesting to see that there is maybe not as much um, division there um, compared to the last one. Um, some of you said that you need more information. That's fair enough. Um, so let's move on to our next one. So here we have a project which involves advertising for survey particip participation on social media with the responses being stored in a database. Okay, 
So it looks like the majority so far are saying this is not CSS because there's not enough competition, which is interesting. Yeah, I'd also agree with that. Um, if you remember on a previous slide, we talked about how CSS is not just using digitized versions of traditional survey methods. Um, so, you know, there is no clear line between how much computation is enough computation, but you do have to ask yourself, you know, if you could do your research um, pretty sufficiently without digital tools, then it's probably not uh, CSS. Um, and if we draw the conversation back to surveys in itself, typically the larger the survey sample, the more necessity there will be for computational tools because the analysis will become much harder. But the use of online surveys doesn't automatically make it a CSS project, as you would probably collect, you know, roughly the same amount of responses through paper surveys as you would online. But there's also um, people saying that there's in not enough um, social science. Um, yeah, fully valid. Where is the research question in this? Um, we know that people are advertising for survey participation on social media and they want to store the responses in a database, but there's no inherent question in here. Um, so yeah, those that have said they want more information as well, bang on, um, because we don't know enough based on this um, one sentence. For instance, it could just be that they're, you know, looking to collect responses about participants' weight and height, for instance, which it's not social science related, is it? So let's go on. So this one, so we've got our second to last project here. So if you're feeling question out, don't worry, we're going to be done soon. So this example looks at reading in real time weather and air pollution data to create complex models of hyperlocal air quality. So straight away, um, it looks like the majority uh, so far are agreeing that this is not CSS due to a lack of a social science focus. Um, votes are still coming in, but I'll just talk a little bit about this as they do. Um, so, you know, we'd have to think about, well, is there a link between hyperlocal air quality and human behavior? Um, based on, you know, this question, it doesn't look like that's what they're looking at. Um, we'd have to know a bit more. Are we looking for a political impact or is there gonna be an overlap between different research fields and schools? Um, maybe an overlap with, you know, geoscience or with physics, it's just not clear by the statement that there's an intent to explore human behavior. So I'd say um, I'd agree that there's probably not enough social science in this statement. Um, but it's interesting to see that, you know, um, as we go on, we're getting a less and less division. So let's move on now to our last case. So here we're looking to train a neural network on social media data with the aim of creating a believable chatbot that is then going to counteract online radicalization. Okay, so what do you think? Is this a CSS project or not? So it looks like uh, the majority of you are saying that this is definitely a CSS project. Um, I do think I'd have to agree with you here, um, and I'll talk a bit about that, uh, but it seems to include all of the components of a CSS project. So there seems to be an implicit social science research question because we're focusing on people's actions, attitudes, and behaviors. You know, we wanna um, get them away from online radicalization. We don't know um, what this radicalization is directed at uh, yet. You know, we're looking at, far right behavior, are we looking at, um, you know, terrorism? Um, and we have this um, computational method to help us explore this. So we've got something called a neural network, which has been trained on social media data. And for those that are unfamiliar with this term, uh, neural networks are a kind of artificial intelligence that teaches computers to process data in a way that's inspired by the human brain. It's a type of machine learning process that's also called deep learning. And it uses these interconnected nodes, or you can think of them as neurons, like the brain, in a sort of layered structure um, that resembles the brain. And this is implemented in the hopes that we can use it to predict a user's behavior based on their social media posts and messages. So in order to train this model, there's probably been a fair bit of web scraping involved. So, you know, looking at sort of like acquiring that data, the person's um, messages and posts, 
So it is very computational stuff. Um, and in order to counter online radicalization, we of course need to have good ideas about what online radicalization is and how people are radicalized and what kind of mental processes are going on. I also think we need to understand how people interact with each other. So looking at how we can convince people to, to accept an idea or a question. So there's methods that need to be put in place to help understand how people change. And if we're talking um, about a computational method, this could be um, from implementing something called natural language processing um, to get more of an idea about the breakdown of language. That could be one example. So yeah, if we're using these kinds of complex computational methods to mimic and interact with individuals, then this is a clear example of computational social science to me. But there is some people that have said there's not enough social science, which is um, fair enough. But I think that for me, there's definitely like a clear social science sort of question in here. Um, you know, looking to move people away from online radicalization, looking at people's behaviors and their actions. So let's move on now from this exercise. Um, the last thing that I wanted to do is just a little word cloud. Um, so you don't have to do this if you don't want, but if you do want to, you can enter maybe a few words about what you uh, have learned so far about computational social science, um, or maybe something that surprised you, something that you found interesting, or anything that you're still curious about. Um, and then as people put stuff in, you'll see that um, the word cloud builds up and yeah, it's quite a nice little visualization. Okay, so digital methods, yep, for sure. Data collection methods, um, computational need for the social element, yeah, for sure, measuring people. Uh -huh. A large data, so yeah, um, uh, CSS projects is often, often um, defined by that sort of uh, large data as well that you're working with. Um, methodology, yeah, that's very important. Um, you're going to be using uh, computational methods. Deep learning, yep, so we mentioned those neural networks. That was one of our computational methods. Um, Web scraping, that came up quite a bit. Large scale behavior, deep learning, yeah. All, all very key points. Um, I'll give that maybe a few more seconds and then we will uh, move on. There is um, two breaks scheduled in this, but what I'll do is I'll leave that up to you guys. So um, there is like a little five minute break scheduled now but maybe just put in the chat if you do want that or you don't want that because i'm quite happy to skip them if people just want to get on with things um happy to skip the break no break happy to continue okay cool yeah that's fair enough um all right cool well a lot of you have put happy to continue um sorry for the minor minority that might I've wanted to get a brew or something, but there is going to be another one. So if you're really desperate for it, we can um we can hop on there. Okay, so let's um skip that and go on to um the next slide. So we're going to talk a bit about um how to become a computational social scientist. So first we'll start by covering um you know what a social scientist is. That um I will try and speed a little bit through these slides. Um so we can get on to the next exercise. Um, but um, so to start with, social scientists uh, think like people. And um, I know that sounds a bit reductive, but what we mean by this is that um, social scientists use a lot of um, sort of like those human type thinking skills like abstraction, inference. Um, they understand fuzzy concepts and background knowledge. And, um, you know, they don't really shy away from grey areas or overlapping categories, as these are just part and parcel of being a social scientist. And it's no surprise that they need these type of skills because social scientists are often studying people, interactions and behaviours, and that's going to require a certain skill set. But um, social scientists do also build up a lot of data skills in the course of their research. 
So if you think about things like response categorization and coding, quality evaluation, pattern detection and statistics, um, these are a, a, a big part of uh, social science research. But, you know, whilst they do use computers, um, this often doesn't involve, uh, traditionally anyway, um, writing computer code. Instead, it might involve um, sort of uh, traditional sort of statistical software programs such as SPSS or uh, Stata or Stata. I can't really remember how people say that one now. Um, but, you know, this is used for statistical analysis. But like I said, um, not much um, code. However, um, we then have computer scientists, right? So obviously as well, we're making some big generalizations here. Um, I am not saying that computer scientists are robots at all, uh, but in contrast to the sort of human type thinking skills that social scientists have, you know, that given that we're focusing on behaviors and action and fuzzy concepts and all that, we could contrast that by saying that computer scientists have to think more like computers. And that's because um, the thinking skills that they have are going to be more along the lines of working with concrete definitions and absolutes. They're going to be thinking more in terms of hierarchies and categories and clearly defined and scoped variables and rules. And in terms of data skills, uh, computer scientists collect, analyze and manipulate data through programming scripts, computational methods and technological tools. But unlike social scientists, they're not usually, again, big generalization here, they're not usually taught to identify or motivate research projects on the basis of societal impact or value. So um, maybe we've got some people attending that are um, social scientists. You might have been used to having to justify your research on the grounds that, you know, rather loosely or however, that it will make the world a better place. You know, it could be um, like our previous example, I'm, in, I'm researching radicalization in, in online forums in order to produce insights that could lead to countermeasures, right? Whereas a computer scientist might be focused on a more um, sort of logical justification for particular projects. So it might be, I want to make this algorithm more efficient so that it uses less memory. So these are just some sort of, um, you know, differences between these two ways of thinking. So in order to do computational social science, you're gonna need a blend of both of these different types of ways of thinking. So you're gonna need uh, that social science sort of brain, you're gonna be um, needing a bit of that uh, computer thinking um, that can be a bit tricky if you're uh, coming from a social science background, because you need to think about how you then translate things so that it can be understood by a machine. And you're gonna need um, a big, uh, um, dollop of <laughs> open-mindedness as well and you're going to need a mixed problem to work on so I will um, whiz through these um, but yeah you're going to need those skills that we briefly touched on before so you're going to need to be able to identify important problems or knowledge gaps you're going to need to consider possible solutions you're going to want to connect problems to relative theories or perspectives and you, you want to be able to collect relevant information and research to frame your approach and all of these things are what social scientists excel at. The ability to understand context and nuanced perspectives, how to communicate abstract ideas, how to attack a research question. Whereas, you know, could be an area where computer scientists may struggle as they're more used to concrete definitions and absolutes rather than sort of the more gray areas or murky social science concepts. Um, and we're also gonna cover now why you're gonna need the, that computer thinking. So you're going to need the ability to access, organize, process and handle vast or complex data. So, you know, if you're web scraping, you're going to need to be you might just web scrape all the text off the page. Right. You're going to need the ability to then process that and pull out the important bits of information. And um, you're going to need to know how to write collaborative code. Um, so often um, a thing that a lot of programmers use is um, GitHub, which is um, like version control um, software or Git, um, where you can sort of like document your code progress and you can upload it so that it's um, reproducible and shareable with other people and you can work on it together. Um, 
You're going to want to also be able to properly document your workflow, um, which is often a step that people neglect. Um, so these are skills that computer scientists um, are going to be used to, as well as data scientists that have been trained in computational methods. But for social scientists, it can be much harder to transition towards these um, sort of like uh, computational skills. But as I've said before, you know, um, social scientists do have those data skills that they can build on. So these are things that we mentioned before, such as coding responses, pattern detection and statistics, uh, formatting surveys. So uh, yeah, this is really important um, because I can tell you as someone that has um, you know, moved from a more social science field to doing more computational social science stuff, that it can be really, really intimidating at first, um, which is why it's good to remember that um, you know, no one starts out with all the skills that they need nor do they know all the skills that they might need to acquire, um, which happens um, quite often. So you might start off by saying, I want to scrape tweets for information on the 2016 US election, right? And you might expect that you're going to need some coding ability, but you might not know that this entails learning about APIs um, or different file formats or ways to visualize the data. But, you know, if you approach... Um, you know, computational social science with an open mind and a willingness to learn, you can gradually gain these skills along the way. And you will also start to understand that some skills are going to have a steeper learning curve than others. So it's going to be fairly simple maybe to learn how to do a little bit of web scraping using some uh, coding packages, um, like there's a popular one called Beautiful Soup. Um, but maybe learning to build your own neural network and then train on a large amount of data, that's going to be way, way more complex. And um, this is where, you know, it will lead you to collaboration with those from other fields. And finally, you're going to need a problem that's going to require these skills. Um, and that is a mixed problem. So the one that requires that blend of social science thinking and also uh, a more computational way of thinking. And some of you might be here today because you've already encountered one of those problems. And I won't be surprised because as resources become more digitized, these problems will become more relevant. Um, as large volumes of data are made available and are updated faster, um, you know, we have more access to um, interesting data. If you think about a classic social science problem, so maybe we're interested in how men and women move through cities differently, or maybe we could narrow that down further than to look at how people with disabilities navigate cities. Traditionally, uh, for this kind of social science problem, maybe what we would have done is station some interviewers in different places um, in, a, in a city um, to stop people as they go past, or maybe to count how many people go by that are using mobility aids, or maybe you'd send out some surveys to people's houses. But now there's much more opportunity for us to gather a large amount of data with computational methods. So you could look at collecting data from public transport networks about how many people bought tickets or swiped their card at the tram stop. And you know you could get sensors which um, track how many cars go past a given point. I think um, some of you that are um, based in Manchester on Oxford Road, you could, I think it's on Oxford Road, they have the little sensors that will tell you, you know, how many bikes have gone past um, in a day, um, stuff like that. Um, and you could use um, AI algorithms and CCTV cameras to identify, you know, how many people are moving through a space. So as you can see, the, um, there are new ways of approaching traditional social science questions. And there's no reason as well why you have to abandon traditional methods completely. Um, Part of good research is evaluating different methods and then comparing outcomes. And it might be interesting to see um, whether by using different methods, you know, you get different answers. And then if so, you can ask, well, why is that? Which may then prompt further questions. Um, so, yeah, um, it can be difficult, but it has a lot of benefits in terms of building upon your computational skills and then strengthening those social science skills that you may already have. Um, okay, so before we move on to the eight-step process, I noticed that the last few times that I've done this workshop, 
a few people have said that they're interested um, to know more about um, maybe a possible career path or, you know, how it is that someone finds their way to doing um, solely computational social science research. So I thought I'd um, highlight how um, my colleagues in my computational social science team um, got into doing this and, you know, their background. Um, I was going to, there's a cool new little function on PowerPoint where you can like sort of like place your camera um, within this little thing, but I then had to put my slides up on Mentimeter, so it's not possible. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I thought, yeah, I'd highlight uh, a bit about uh, my colleagues and their background. So you can see we have on the far left, uh, my boss, Jules, um, who did an undergrad in linguistics and then a master's in evolution of language and cognition. And then she went on to do a PhD. Um, we also have my colleague, Nadia, who did criminology at undergrad and then did a research master's degree in criminology and social stats. And um, I did a politics undergrad and then did a conversion degree uh, master's in data science and AI, which was aimed actually at students from a non-computational, um, a non-computer science background. And I, I did that at the Uni of Liverpool where I did my undergrad. And I'm highlighting this um, not to show off about us, uh, but um, just to really hammer home that, you know, there's no... CSS degree there's no perfect degree for it not yet anyway I do think there is more um, computer computational social science type degrees popping up out there I know the Uni of Manchester now offers um, a master's in social research methods and statistics with com uh, computational social science um, but the main thing that I want to stress here is that you don't need to have studied um, computational methods at undergrad or um for your masters to undertake CSS projects, because chances are your undergrad and masters, or maybe some of you have done a PhD, the chances are it's provided you with useful, really useful transferable skills that you can carry out, um, that will enable you to carry out a CSS project. So you can see that um, my boss Jules gained sort of text mining skills and a knowledge of how to perform statistical analysis in an undergrad, and also learn about advanced stats and agent-based modeling and stuff in her master's and um, PhD. And Nadia, um, like many of those, gains uh, skills in an undergrad related to traditional um, statistical software. So there might be a lot of you out there that are um, familiar with SPSS um, and Stata. Um, um, that's what uh, Nadia traditionally learned and then was introduced to the programming language R. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, these programming languages in the next slide. Um, so this is basically, like I said, you know, not to show off about, wow, look at all these things that we've done. It's um, just to show that, you know, no one comes out of the gate um, equipped with these coding skills. They are all stuff that you can build on if you have an undergrad. Um, you know, and have used stuff like SPSS, or even if you haven't. Um, so as mentioned in the previous slide, you don't need to be an expert coder to carry out a CSS project. Um, after all, um, collaboration is going to be key. And for those of us that are students or academics working in higher education, we are super lucky to have a big um, pool of potential collaborators to work with. So if you are thinking of taking out a uh, taking on quite an intensive uh, computational uh, project, um, do consider reaching out to enlist a programmer or an expert on neural networks to help you with your project. But to carry out, um, you know, a successful um, computational social science project, um, you probably will um, want to at some point have some knowledge of programming languages like R or Python. And that's because these uh, languages offer packages and libraries um, which contain uh, functions that are going to help you implement your computational method. So um, in our team, for instance, um, Nadia is our resident R expert. Um, some of you might have heard of R already, um, and it is becoming quite popular in the social science uh, field. Um, and it's been used for a while in other fields like biomedical science. Um, we get a lot of biostatisticians uh, that come to our talks and say that they are familiar with R. And if you have previously used um, 
stata or stata um, before, you'll find that it's quite similar. Um, and it is really user friendly. Um, it's this one here uh, on the left. It has um, quite a nice approachable layout. And you have the benefit as well of not having to faff about with picking a code editor as it's all provided with R Studio. So you only have to really install R and then R Studio. There's not, um, you know, you don't have to go shopping for different um, code editors. And it is also superb at producing data visualizations. So it's a very good choice for those that already have a background in statistics as you are probably gonna find the syntax and the functions are more intuitive. Whereas um, in my team, um, me and my um, colleague Jules uh, mostly use Python. Um, and that's just down to what we were familiar with during our masters, or, although I do think Jules used R a fair bit as well. So when it comes to Python, it's more of a general, lang uh, general purpose language. Um, so, you know, it's not just limited to data science. It has a much broader user base and is popular with all sorts of coding people, web developers, software developers, etc. But it is also known for its simplicity and its readability. Um, the syntax is quite easy to pick up. Um, uh, you know, from my experience, it's what I learned during my master's and I had no coding experience whatsoever definitely wasn't someone uh, for whom it came like really um, natural to um, code, you know, I had to work at it, but I found Python um, quite like um, accessible for someone like me. Um, but the one thing is, you know, unlike R, you're gonna have to do a bit of shopping around for what kind of coding editor you want to use. So you can see here, uh, I use something called Jupyter Notebook. Uh, where you can code in little chunks. I find that quite easy and you can put some text in and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, like I've said, um, I'm not gonna go massively, massively into this side of things as this is just an intro workshop and I don't wanna totally overwhelm anyone. But uh, for me, I'd say the biggest learning curve was in terms of getting into programming and computational methods was actually setting up my computational environment and learning basic code. So what I mean by setting up my computational environment is stuff like, you know, how do I navigate my command line and install software or coding packages, right? How do I write my first function in Python or R? What code editor do I use for Python? And that's why, um, a project that we're going to be sort of um, carrying out soon and if you uh, keep a look out on the UKDS events page for it you'll see um, that we're going to be hosting a coding anxiety club which starts in I think I start I think it starts at the end of November like I said um, please keep it posted I think Emma might actually have the dates for that um, and she'll put that um, in the chat and you know look out on the events page and it's going to be hosted uh, twice a month so on the first and third Tuesdays of each month. And it's just going to be a half an hour session. So I think it's half one until two, where you can basically come along and learn some key skills, which we'll be demonstrating live. So you don't need to have anything set up. We'll be doing stuff live and we'll be helping you with how to navigate this, how to set things up, because that is, in my opinion, or something that, you know, you don't really get taught. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd include um, a little bit on that. Um, I'll just have a check of the chat. Someone said, Kate said, I haven't tried it. I use R 99% of the time, but I understand that you can code in Python in the new version of R Studio. I guess it'd be good for people to switch between both. Wow, that's really, really interesting. I didn't know that because I do code a little bit in R as well, but that would be really, really useful. So um, yeah, nice one. Thanks, Kate, for that. Um, good if anyone wants to code in both. Now apparently you can do it in R, so sweet. Um, okay. So um, what I'd like to um, quickly introduce you to before we decide whether we take a short break or steam on ahead um, is this eight step process for how to undertake um, your first computational social science project. Um, so 
after the break, whether we have it or not, I'll go into detail about each of these steps. And this will be about um, identifying problems, exploring the problems, formalizing concepts, collecting data, implementing software, and verifying the concepts, then using these concepts to experiment or analyze data, discussing your findings and presenting a conclusion, then communicating, publishing it, um, and presenting those findings and sharing your findings as well as documenting and validating your findings. So what we'll do is we'll kind of, um, I'll ask you if you want to, you can sort of like jot down maybe some ideas of a project that you might have. Um, there will be a little bit of interaction where you can say maybe what it is that you'd like to do for your first CSS projects. We can have a little bit of a chat about it, um, but yeah. So um, as I said before, to make this process useful, um, I want you to start thinking about either a project that you'd like to tackle or a research idea that you might have been thinking about. Or, you know, it can even be a project that you've done in the past. Um, you can jot this idea down or, you know, um, put it into the mentee meeting when we have those uh, interactions. And just basically keep it in mind as we go through these steps. So step one is identify the problem. So once you've identified the problem, you're going to want to be as clear and specific as possible about the pattern, problem, or uh, lack of insight. You'll also want to ident identify who is involved, where it is, etc. And what this will do is help you to define your research question. So maybe we have a goal in mind. So we might, um, as I mentioned before, um, about looking how people navigate their way through city centres, we might have as our goal to get more people traveling actively through city centers. Maybe we want less cars on the road and more people riding their bikes or their scooters or just being able to get from A to B in their wheelchair. So the research question um, rather loosely might be, what are the barriers to active travel in city centers? So what you'll need to do is identify who is involved. So you can start to list um, who is involved, whether that be potential companies, people, or different demographics that might be of interest to you. So for our example, we might want to look at city councils, bus companies, different businesses, different types of vehicles. And it's better when you're building this list as well to just go all out with it, as it gives you lots of different avenues to explore. And, you know, you can always cross off um, avenues that you've you know, you've not been able to go down or, you know, maybe after you've done a little, a little bit more investigation into them, you've decided they're not actually relevant. Just good to jot everything down. The next step then is going to be exploring the problem. So this is where you'll gather information and perspectives in multiple ways. So, um, you know, could be through surveys, observations, secondary data analysis, uh, web scraping using uh, APIs. Um, this might involve conducting a few interviews with people of interest. Um, so if we stick with uh, my initial example that I said, we could interview the man manager for our city's uh, transport network or maybe some local council workers. Um, but you'd probably also need a survey or observations or some secondary data analysis to capture how many people are actually moving through the city centre. So it's about you know using different methods and tools to further under to further enhance your understanding of the problem or the research topic, and you'll also want to spell out sub problems, processes, uh, relationships, simplifications, assumptions, and um, related issues. So after you know you've settled on your main research question, you're going to need to get more specific in order to make that question relevant and measurable. So if um, we've got our sort of main question, let's say, you know, what are the barriers to active travel in the city centre? That might be our main question, but you might specifically be focusing on, you know, what are the barriers to active travel through this specific city centre at this specific time of day, given the way that XYZ uh, roads are laid out, right? So this is where you really nail down the particulars of your research question. So what we'll do now is we can switch over to Mentimeter for a minute. Um, Maybe if Emma could pop the code back in. Um, I know that some people tend to click off Mentimeter once we've done uh, previous interactions, which is fair news. So uh, we'll um, have the code uh, put in the chat. And you can feel free to tell me a bit about um, what your step one or two would be. Um, 
no worries if you don't want to share you know you can always just keep a note of it for yourself um, you might just want to get some of your own research ideas flowing and um, if you do decide that you find this useful and as well um you know it doesn't have to be well defined i know it's hard to outline these steps if you've got only kind of like a vague idea but for step one it could be as simple as people on twitter from different political camps really seem to hate each other i want to look at a political polarization on twitter and your step two might be i'm going to gain access to twitter's api and see what i can find by scraping some tweets and maybe i'll see how i can build a big data set so it doesn't have to be super super um intense um can we see the step one and two descriptions again yeah sure okay so let's just go back um so we've got identifying our problem so being as clear and specific as possible about the pattern the problem or the gap in research that we're looking to cover um, kind of like listing who is involved, maybe what certain demographics we want to look at. Um, I gave my example of, um, you know, looking at active uh, travel through city centres. So I might want to look at, you know, city councils, bus companies, different businesses in the area. Um, so just basically making a big list of what it is we're going to study or look at. Then for our step two, um, we want to... Um, explore the problem a bit more so gather some information and perspectives in different ways and um, gave the example of you know surveys secondary data analysis some web scraping and for my particular example i thought of looking at a few uh, conducting a few interviews maybe with um the manager for uh, the city's transport network or a few local council workers um so yeah, after settling on your main research question, this is where you get a bit more specific and, um, you know, nail down the particulars. So like I said, for my question, it would be, um, you know, what are the barriers to active travel through this specific city centre that I'm focusing on um, through, at this specific time of day, uh, that sort of thing. So I'll um, leave it up maybe for a minute. Like I said, don't worry if you don't want to put anything down. It's... Um, it's not a test or anything. Um, so nice, we've got one response. Um, so for step one, what factors cause pedestrians to get lost? Um, and then for our exploring the, of the problem, a web map and questionnaire to get locations of details of how they get lost, crowd signage. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, my research question is the representation, representation of unconscious bias against women in contemporary fiction. Nice one. That's really, really cool. And you could then look at maybe um, if you did want to make it computational, you could look at some web scraping, maybe. Um, I've definitely, um, or like text mining, I've done it before where I've um, got like a digital book and I've kind of like um, done some like text mining on it to pull out different insights and themes from uh, books, which is um, which is a uh, Quite a fun thing to do and um, we've got another one step one understanding outcome of internal police investigations regarding officer corruption in brazil sounds super super interesting step two accessing police internal documents and identifying outcome of disciplinary proceedings yeah nice one that's something where you know you want to probably process them um with computational methods as you know manually that's probably going to take a lot of time you know you could use some natural language processing um you could look at um you know totaling those outcomes and you know aggregating certain findings then we've got students travel from all over london to rehearsal attending four times per week does method distance and time of travel affect attendance attitudes or attainment could you use google or city map api yeah and I, I assume with the bracket as well you've got um you know potential costs maybe I think you're implying of that um that's always something that is important to think about um when it comes to you know acquiring your data so for instance you know you might have big ideas like um I was really interested recently in scraping a lot of data from Twitter but um under its or, or x um as it's known now but under its new um sort of management by Elon Musk it's now um you know, it's it's under a paid um, like it's it, you have to pay basically to use that API. So that kind of like cuts off a, 
kind of like an avenue you have to use like other um sort of like twitter packages which aren't as good you can't get um as much data so these are all uh, really important things to consider when it you know does come to um carrying out your project um exploring gender bias in language using social work reports yeah nice one um the trajectory of 21st century graduate skills requested by employers scrape online job descriptions and analyze for skills and how they change over time yeah Super, super interesting. Yeah. And we've got our final one. Uh, my research question is, what is the link between personality traits of senior management and financial performance of companies? Yeah, that'd be really cool to sort of like identify what is, um, what are the, you know, big five personality traits of those that are sort of like successful, successful sorry, in those areas. Um, step one is trust, distrust, an important reason why people are, di are disengaging from politics. Step two, gather social media posts relating to politicians and politics. Yep. I work in open access scholar scholarly publishing. Although the OA movement has been established over two decades ago, there is a large barrier to its acceptance in many academic circles. Nice one. These are, yeah, like awesome, awesome projects. Um. I'll leave it maybe a couple more seconds. Um, I see this one has something a little bit cut off. If you want to put that in, no worries. But yeah, no pressure. I'll, um, I'll leave it another minute and then we'll move on. But yeah, these are all super, super interesting um, projects. Uh, perceptions of AI use in policy decision making. Yeah, the keywords used to describe AI in digital media. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of buzz now, isn't there, about um, sort of... Um, AI and uh, um, you know large language models now um, like ChatGPT that'd be something that's you know, be really interesting to explore. I think now I'll um, move on just because I'm conscious that we've got a little bit to get through. Um, so we'll move on to our step three. I'll just have a little check of the chat. Um, will there be a recording of this? Um, yes, there will be. I don't know why I had to think about that. Yeah. Um, so. Everything, every workshop that we do gets put up on our um, UKDS YouTube. Yeah, Emma's just put in the chat. Um, so the slides and the recording is going to be available on the event webpage. And uh, maybe if Emma could um, link to our YouTube as well. Um, I think uh, she linked before to our computational social science playlist. Um, ton of stuff on there. You know, if you come away from this and you're like, okay, well, I want to try carrying out my first computational method, my... Um, Best advice to you is check out our playlist and see what appeals to you. We've got loads of interactive notebooks on our GitHub as well, where you can follow along with um, the code. Um, so yeah, please do check all of those out. So moving on to step three, um, this is where you need to formalize your concepts. And what I mean by this is you'll want to make all the, pro the concepts and processes explicit, formal, and both computer and human understandable. So, um, when it comes to computer science, um, this is often something that's known as a uh, pseudocode. Um, you know, it's where we um, kind of like jot things down in terms of um, our functions and how we want them to act. Um, but, you know, you don't need to know how to write code. You just need to start understanding how to formalize things. So, um, for example, Maybe you've got a research question which focuses on trust, right? And um, someone mentioned political um, our trust of um, politicians and uh, maybe political parties. Um, that's very social sciencey sort of concept is trust. Um, and if your goal is to get a computer to be able to measure it or model it or represent it in a simulation, then you will have to define it in a way that a computer would understand. So it's about how we, you know, translate these concepts over. To a machine right so you could maybe define trust as a variable between zero and a hundred you can make rules about how that variable will change in certain situations maybe if two parties interact positively um or you know uh, you get some sentiment scores of uh, people's opinions of uh, politicians online maybe the more that in score increases then trust increases but then given a negative interaction, um, if you think of it being maybe two parties, maybe if one of them is judged to be deceitful, levels of trust then could decline or reset to zero. 
So basically, you start have to start thinking about how to formalize concepts in your research question so that a computer would be able to understand it. So that's what we mean uh, when we talk about formalizing the concepts. Oops, that didn't work. Um, and then we're on to step four. So this involves collecting data, implementing software, and verifying your process. So you'll need to select and implement one or more methods. So many of you might have thought about these methods in step two when we talked about exploring um, your problem. So uh, some of you wrote down web scraping. Um, you could also look at um, agent-based modeling or sentiment analysis. So, um, you know, the, the person who said they were looking at um, scraping, um, you know, social media posts maybe about politicians you can do something in text mining um, called sentiment analysis. So basically, there's different approaches to it. You can get a, a Python or an R package that will do that, and it'll take a sentence, and it will give each word a score, um, or it'll give the whole sentence a score. I um, can't remember the particulars now, but uh, basically, you know, it'll um, give you a score for that sentiment, and then um, you can look at... Uh, how people are feeling about these politicians are they is the sentiment score overall high or is it low um what particular words is it that people are using so if you look at these words that are um flagging up constantly with low sentiment scores you can then make a nice little word cloud to sort of demonstrate that um these are there's loads of ways to do this with um uh, python and r packages um, and there's tons of examples online as well of people uh, that have done this um, so yeah, this is the step where you implement these methods and you make sure that they work in the way that you anticipated. So, um, you know, when it comes to computational research, um, you know, you've got to be used to, um, well, how do you say it, like um, curveballs and, you know, um, just things sometimes going wrong. So maybe, for instance, the data comes in a different format than you expected, or maybe you're encountering a lot of error messages in your code. So, you know, this step is about um, can you, you know, make it wait, work in the way that you expect? Um, maybe um, you could use a toy data set rather than your full data set while you fine tune your method. If my function um, in, in my code isn't working, what I do sometimes is I reduce my data set down to it's teeny tiny and then I just make it work on a few rows so then I can maybe see what's going wrong. Sometimes when you apply a function to a whole data set, it's kind of hard to actually pinpoint what the problem is. Um, and, you know, like I said, when your data comes in a different format than you expected, it's frustrating. Um, my colleague Jules recently had a project where she was looking to uh, scrape um, online articles and she wanted to look at um, the use of person-first um, language um, versus... I can't remember the other one, but basically, um, so, you know, you can think of um, journals that might use autistic person or person with autism, right? She wanted to look at the proportions of um, these uses and uh, which one is being used more in scientific um, journals. Um, but, you know, in doing that, she found that um, she uh, had to scrape PDFs, right? This is not a format that she was expecting. And these PDFs were notoriously hard to work with. So that was a bit of a learning curve. And, it, you know, it sort of set the project back a little bit. And these are just things that, you know, are part and parcel of working with computational methods sometimes. So, yeah, you know, um, your um, choice of method is going to be highly dependent as well on the research topic. And the last thing that you're going to need to do as well is thoroughly check that the selected method has been implemented correctly. Um, this is what we mean when we talk about verifying your process or method. It's about, you know, answering the question, well, did we do the thing right? I hope some of that's made a little bit of sense and you can feel free to talk about what your steps um, three and four would look like. Again, um, you know, I know this is hard if you've not, when you've not actually undertaken the research or implemented any methods, but you could share any vague ideas you might have, or you could just decide not to share at all, and that's totally fine. We can move on, but I'll leave it for maybe a minute or so. Um, the code's at the top as well if you want to um, head over to Menti if you've clicked off. Step three has flunked me. <laughs> Fair enough. 
Step four, possibly use sentiment analysis, scrape social media, search keywords. Yeah. Um, step three, yeah, I, I appreciate that, you know, formalizing your concepts um, and sort of making sure they translate over to um, to be like machine readable. It's just about, um, you know, making sure you pick your computational method really and um, making sure it's the appropriate one. Uh, Police corruption project, step three, identify the relevant laws and terms for disciplinary proceedings for more exact info retrieval. Step four, content analysis through LLM use. Nice. Step three, what proportion of political posts refer to trust, whether trusted towards individual people or to a system? Uh, yeah, that'd be, you could, you know, look at sort of like the keywords that, um, to pull out from that. Um, you know, you could have like um, your sort of like a list of people um, that you want to look at, or yeah, like you said, you could be looking at keywords maybe that refer just to sort of systems. So you could be looking at people talking about maybe elites or um, you know, things of that nature. Step four, scrape social media, search keywords, and maybe sentiment analysis. Yeah, that sounds really, really good. I intended to use grounded theory in my project that wants to investigate the lived experiences of women living in oil polluted areas using thematic analysis and watch out for themes. Okay, that sounds good. Could you maybe you could expand more about like what sort of computational method you might want to use or whether you think that um, what how that fits into sort of computational social science? Um sounds like a really, really interesting uh, research area for sure. And I suppose as well, thinking about um, sort of political posts as well, you know, you can think of scraping different platforms and whether different platforms have different sort of user base. Because um, I know, for instance, like um, X or Twitter, largely a young user base, um, maybe different forums are, are different. Um, just so you, maybe you're looking at a particular demographic, um, younger people, for instance. Travel times and student outcomes. Luckily, some already machine readable. Uh, nice one, attendance and task scores. That sounds good. Could use sentiment analysis for attitudes as well as API scraping for travel methods. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, these are really, really cool. Um, maybe I'll leave it a few more seconds if uh, any more pop up. I don't want to click to the next slide and um, miss one if you're typing it out. Yeah, we'll just leave it up for a few more seconds. Okay, I'll head on. I'm really sorry if you are just about to put the paragraph and I cut you off. Um, you can always put it in the chat and I'll have a look at it. Um, okay, so for step five, you'll then run the experiment and analyze the data. So, you know, you'll build the models. If you're looking to implement a model, analyze the data, or otherwise use the methods that you've selected in that previous step. Um, and then you'll be looking to identify and explain the results within the context of the experiment, the model, or the method that you've used, right? So if you're looking at um, maybe something like um, social network analysis, um, you could talk about what the biggest nodes are in that and uh, measures of centrality, stuff like that. Um, let's go on to step six. So once you've run your experiments and you've analyzed the data, you can then start to interrogate the results and form some conclusions. So this means going beyond the experiment, the model or the method to draw some conclusions about what the results mean. So what sort of picture they're forming? Um, do the findings support policy recommendations? Um, who or what do these results affect and what does it matter? What should then change? Who benefits from that proposed change? So, you know, if we use that example of looking at how people move through cities, perhaps we found that people with disabilities related to mobility have um, they have more difficulty navigating through particular areas. Maybe there's particular stretches of road where there are uneven surfaces or, you know, roads that are too narrow, in which case you can recommend some changes, which could be wider footpaths in XYZ area. And now that, that we're nearing the end of the research process, uh, this is where we start to focus on communicating and sharing our research. 
So in terms of communicating uh, the research, it's important to understand that all of the previous steps that we've mentioned, they've got to be communicated to multiple audiences in multiple ways. And what's really important is that you think about short-term and long-term engagement. So for a lot of us online might instantly go to, well, I want to get this published in an academic journal, which, yeah, fair enough, it's definitely important. But it is also good to think about other forms of communication. So are you going to present your work at a particular conference or do you want to submit a piece about it uh, for a blog? And you could think about whether there are any sort of workshops or classes that you could present to get your research shared more widely. Um, and with that, you'll want to think about how you then adapt your style and tone of communication to suit these different audiences. You know, how we write in a blog or we present something, um, you know, yeah, in a blog um, compared to like a, a journal article, that tone is going to be slightly different, right? It might be a bit more informal, um, spice things up on your blog as compared to, um, you know, an academic journal. So you just don't want to keep that in mind. And finally, you'll want to share, document and validate your findings. Um, what we mean when we talk about validating um, your research is making sure that the right thing was done by allowing your work to be studied, reproduced and or modified as needed. To do that, you'll want to allow as many people as possible to access your methodology in any code or data. So you want your research to be as transparent, well-documented and open as possible. And of course, there's going to be caveats to this. So you could be working with administrative data that's restricted. So you could look at um, workarounds. You could maybe create a sort of dummy data set so that people can still run your code and work through your methodology without you compromising um, any sort of um, confidentiality. So yeah, reproducibility is a really important part of research and it is often neglected. Um, I'm sure may, maybe some of you will have heard of the notorious sort of like um, reproducibility uh, crisis in um, certain fields. I don't know whether it was psychology that was a big one for it um, recently, but um, this is why it's good to think about, you know, how you'll document your work before your research gets underway, because it's definitely something that a lot of people are now paying a lot, a lot of attention to. And just to note a few things at the end, so these steps are not linear, as there are many points from each step that you're going to need to return to or apply throughout the research process. Uh, for instance, docu documenting your research is something that you want to apply from the beginning. And when it comes to computational social science projects, most or all are going to require many iterations, which means revisiting certain steps. So maybe you'll come up with a research question in step one, but after exploring the problem further in step two, you, may want, you might want to jump back to step one to reformulate the research question in light of something that you've read. And uh, you know, maybe you're on step four and you've implemented your method, but you might need to then go back to step three because you've not outlined the concepts and processes enough. And that's why you know documentation is important, just so that you can capture all these nuances and changes as your research evolves. Um, I've definitely had it before where I'll make some really important changes to my code, but I won't document it. And then when I come to write in my methodology, I'm then really struggling to explain why it is that I opted for, you know, this type of algorithm or this particular module. So it is a really, really important. And it's actually a really good habit to get used to. So, you know, when you're sketching out your research question, you can note down why it is that you think it's important. Um, and then what you'll find is that the research does actually kind of write itself. Um, it's just a much nicer process. Um, and when it comes to your code as well, um, a good practice is often to put it in a code repository to, uh, to protect it. And you can also put it in the cloud and make it available for others to look at, which is great because, you know, when you spent so long looking at your own code, sometimes it becomes difficult to spot issues with it. But then if you have a colleague look at it or a friend, um, it can be really helpful as they may spot a problem that you've actually overlooked. So it's like we talked about at the beginning, um, it's important to be open minded and remember that you don't um, have to know everything about um, computer science. You just want to know enough to be able to have those productive collaborative conversations with others in the field. So you may be able to reach out to someone who's more computer science -y than you, who you may want to collaborate with on some code or another part of your project. So it's always good to keep that in mind. 
Finally, um, we have a few minutes left, but if you want to share your last minute takeaways on what CSS is and maybe why it's important, you can pop them in Mentimeter. Um, maybe Emma can put the code uh, back on. Um, someone said they need to go to another meeting. No worries. Uh, feel free to hop off whenever. Um, but thanks for coming. And yeah, the code is 7642259A. Um, you can feel free to put uh, some stuff in a word card. You don't have to if you don't want to. And uh, then we'll go to the last couple of slides and we'll do a Q&A. So if you want to ask me any questions, um, please feel free. Um, optimistic, that is makes me so glad to hear that. Um, reminded me to retake our, um, yeah, we need to get those coding skills up. Informed process. Exciting. Yeah, definitely. I think it is really exciting. Um, as someone who um, does uh, computational social science, yeah, it's definitely a really exciting field. Um, developing quickly, yep. Um, this, you know, we are fortunate to have access to so much data now. Um, it's a really exciting time to be learning computational methods because there's just so much out there. You know, if you think about social media and you're a social scientist and you want to know about people's opinions on things, you know, you're kind of spoiled, obviously, if um, you can get access to the API. Um, but there is ways around things as well. Um, social science research core followed the steps. Yep. Um, exciting and excited. I'm glad um, I'm glad um, that people are feeling that way. Informed. Um, AI, yep. Um, I mean, we live in an age, right, where everyone's talking about chat GPT, right? Um, it is computational methods and, um, you know, AI and stuff like that. Um, it's a big, big topic at the minute. Interdisciplinary, yeah, for sure. Um, like I said, you know, no one's expecting you to be, um, you know, that person on CSI where like there's a bunch of like green code going past and, you know, you're hacking the mainframe, right? Um, you don't need to, no one needs to be knowing how to do that. Um, you know, you just want to learn a few skills. And that's why I really think, and I want to really plug again, our Coding Anxiety Club, if you want to come join us and uh, we'll help you set up your computational environment and we'll help you get started with things. We're going to have different sessions on different things. Um, just like, you know, what are file pathways? How do you navigate your terminal? Um, how do you, you know, know where you are in your directory inside the terminal or um, that kind of stuff? Um, so, yeah, um, we'll see what the chat says. Thanks for the information. You did not mention NVivo as a tool or it's not relevant here. Um, I haven't used NVivo, but... Um, uh, blessing if you want to tell us a bit more about it um please feel free to do so um julie this has been so helpful well paced and informative feel so much better and comfortable with this stuff as a newbie that's so so good to hear genuinely uh thank you um um yeah thanks everyone and also just um you know we do have time for a q a but it's, it's no worries if you need to get off it's absolutely fine or if there's just no questions totally fine too uh these are the references for anyone interested and we will be making the presentation slides available so you can always go back and look at these in more detail. And also as well, um, when you leave the webinar, you can complete our short survey. Maybe you found this too fast, too slow, didn't cover enough things. You want us to cover some different topics. You can think of some stuff that I should maybe add. Um, you know, if you fill it in, you can tell me all about that stuff um, as well. If you do have any particular, you know, questions or queries on projects, you can feel free to email me at any time. Um, and I'm also on Twitter as well. Um, I'm not that on there a ton, um, but I am on there occasionally. Um, and we've got our UK data service on Twitter as well. But yeah, I guess if no one has any major questions, I'll just say thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at some more events.